Bonjour à tous, c'était Camon. On se retrouve sur une actu info de jeu euh, Nightingale, où j'avais fait une pause en étant arrivé au okay, gay, tout simplement. Là, on discute tranquille. Et euh, apparemment, la 0.2 va arriver et les maintenant sont en cours. Je vous propose de regarder euh, ce qu'il nous raconte. Je vous traduis la vidéo. Et puis voilà. Bonjour à tous. Hey, Realm Walkers. Welcome back to another developer update video. Today we'll be chatting about the upcoming 0.2 update for Nightingale, as well as answering some of your commonly asked questions about how we prioritize work, and then sharing some additional information about ongoing initiatives. So let's jump right in. Next week, we will be launching the 0.2 update for Nightingale. Up until now, we've primarily been focusing on bug fixing for the original launch build, but this will be the first update that has a couple of quality of life features, as well as larger changes to existing gameplay. Let's start off with some quality of life features which are in this update. For this update, you'll be able to craft using the resources from nearby chests at your workbenches. Currently, the range is about 12 meters from where you're crafting. And for reference, one building tile is about four meters wide or tall for those of you who want to get ahead of rearranging your wares. You'll also be able to queue up to six things at a crafting bench. Whether you want to go realm diving, log off for the night, or just do other things at your estate, your benches will continue to work through all of the tasks that you've assigned to it. If the bench needs fuel, just make sure that it has enough in order to finish the tasks at hand. Another change is that after you've met an essence trader, you will be able to purchase their wares directly from your guidebook. This includes both recipes as well as their resources. To discuss some recent and upcoming changes to our crafting systems, we're going to chat with David, one of our game designers and master of spreadsheets. Hi, I'm David Holmes. I'm a senior designer here at Inflection Games. I work on the crafting system, and there have been some changes that have come in over the past few weeks. And I'm here today to talk to you about what those changes are and how we're planning on addressing community feedback going forward. So originally with the crafting system in Nightingale, we were hoping that players would be able to change the items they got out of what they made by changing the items that they put into it. We're hoping that players would be able to find new ways to play and find a set of items and a build that really fit their play style to suit the kind of content that they wanted to play. This also was to really help us expand the game in live service and make sure that players had a wide range of content that they could play without blowing through it too quickly because they need to mix and match and experiment with different items and crafts and builds in order to find what worked for them. Something that we've been concerned about since the game went live is that players have had an engaging and consistent experience across their whole playthrough. We found two issues that made sure players were going through content faster than we were expecting. Infinitely stacking stats onto crafted items meant that players could one-shot end game content, but it also made their player profiles so large that it prevented some players from logging into the game. Originally, we had intended that players wouldn't be able to use the same material multiple times in order to gain the same benefit. This meant that there was really only a few items that players would ever want to use when they're making a crafted item. And we were hoping that players would explore the world and find new materials to fit their play styles. When we updated this as part of the fix for infinite stacking, we discovered that players really liked how it had been working. So we've listened to our players and we're working on turning this back on in a designed and sustainable way. The way crafting an item works right now is that an item has a set of baseline stats. And as you add new resources into the crafting recipe, those stats get multiplied by the resources. This means that if one of those resources has an attribute of zero, its output stat is also going to be zero. Unfortunately, we found this more complicated than we were expecting, and so we're going to work on changing this for 0.2. So for 0.2, we've made a change that says if a stat is on a resource, it will be on the crafted item. So if the gun that you're making doesn't have stealth, but the material you're using does, that means that the gun that you craft will have stealth on it. To balance out the fact that we're going to have new stats on items, we're going to make a change across the board so that resources will have a reduced number of stats. But one of the things we're trying really hard to make sure is that the spirit of a resource remains the same. So if a resource was really good at melee damage before, it will still be really good at melee damage. 
as a way to compensate for the fact that we're now expecting players to put the same material into an item multiple times, we're gonna look at introducing a soft cap and hard cap system. This means that as a player adds an attribute to an item, eventually they'll reach a point where that item starts to produce diminishing returns on its benefits. And eventually you'll reach the hard cap which says you've made it to the end, the item is as good as it can be, great job. With these changes, we feel that we've been able to maintain the original vision of giving players control over their play style through their crafted items, while improving understandability and flexibility as they do so. In addition to these crafting changes, we've also done a pass on building costs for player structures. As we spoke with players, we worked to better understand how you're building things, and we found that material costs, especially for advanced buildings, was too high, and so we've worked at reducing these costs in order for you to be able to construct advanced structures more quickly. Thank you so much for all your feedback. We absolutely love hearing from our players, and we're gonna keep working on this in the future to make it even better. Some changes are also coming to combat with this update. For that, we're going to chat with Michael, lead designer and chief bound wrangler. Hi, I'm Michael Carter. I'm the lead gameplay designer here at Inflection Games. So we're introducing two new bound in this update, the bound Aegis and the bound Breaker. The bound Aegis uh, uses two shields to defend itself and its allies. It also has aggressive charges that can come and disrupt player positioning, uh, as well as prevent you from damaging his friends, including the bound Breaker, which is the other new unit, which has a very large cannon on his back that fires off large, slow projectiles that if you're in the way of, would deal a lot of damage. Uh, up close, not as effective, but at range, it's devastating. We've also made changes to the old bound, including the lamp lighter, which now is a ranged attack. It fires off a short burst of attacks at range, and then if you come into melee, we'll attack with the other bound minions. We've also made a change to the bombardier. Uh, the bombardier now no longer throws a miasma grenade that explodes on impact into an AOE. Rather, now it'll throw a fuse grenade that when it lands, detonates after a short period of time, dealing instant damage and leaving no AOE behind. Now, we changed how the bound Dark Weaver worked. We found that its presence wasn't adding a lot to combat, Previously, you would possess a bound and make it immune to damage while it's self being vulnerable. However, that wasn't really playing out the way we wanted it to, so we've changed it around to it becoming immune and buffing the target it's possessing. It should lead to more dynamic experience, and of course, all the previous tools that you could use, such as the spell, still function. So we've added some new options for the player as well as what we've given to the bound. So with the player, we've identified the early game lacked a lot of range to combat. Mostly the slingbow was the only thing players had access to until the provisioner. We've added some new ranged options for players, particularly in the early game. These are the throwing knives, the grenades, and the blunderbuss. These all offer different ways of dealing at range, close up, far away, and of course, area of effect. These should complement the new range bound we have and offer new opportunities and versatility for the player that wants them. We've made some modifications to the one-handed tools in our game. We found that the one-handed weapons weren't performing as well as we wanted. So as you heard with the uh, grenades and the throwing knives, those are both offhand tools that you can use in junction with the one-handed tools. We also found that they lacked a defensive or offensive nature that we wanted to add. So for the knife, we added a parry. It's a short-term block that allows you to regain stamina if you time it properly. And of course, to give it a reaction to the enemy that you've done, depending on the size. The sickle now offers the opportunity to clear out hordes using a boomerang that goes out a short period and hits multiple enemies. And the hammer has a flurry of blows which allows you to hit multiple times in a quick succession, but requires careful timing on the player's part to explode while you do it. There are other combat changes coming in point two, in particular, a global dodge. This now gives dodge to two-handed weapons, but has required a control scheme change. Control is now dodge, C is crouch, and V is for the crafting menu. If you don't like these, you can feel free to rebind them, but this does bring us in line with other games in the genre. We've made some stat changes, particularly removing and consolidating some stats. Stamina efficiency has been removed, as it was confusing to players, and you can just increase your stamina at its core to gain the same benefit. Blocking efficiency has been combined with uh, injury resistance. The injury bar builds up at the bottom of the screen, so we kept a consistency there with falling. Environmental resistances are now one stat. What was hot and cold resistance are now one stat. Players weren't really dealing with these at the same time, so it wasn't important for players to have different versions of them. However, damage types, such as poison and fire, have been kept separate because they're more important. We've also decided to remove strength, at least from a player modification point of view. It led to a muddiness in the way that players were using our tools, and particularly added confusion of when a creature would or wouldn't react. These are now consistent across the tools from beginning to the end of the game, and should give the players a very consistent experience and common experience among weapons. We've also decided to move the range step. It was confusing to players and wasn't super clear. Now the range is a core part of the weapon identity. Pistols go a certain distance, same with rifles and shotguns. We also fixed the bug with magic damage scaling. It should now scale appropriately. Thanks so much for playing. We've got lots of exciting ideas coming and we're excited to hear your feedback. 
Something that we get asked quite often is why is this bug not fixed yet? Or why is this feature that you talked about not out yet? So let's talk about it. When it comes to bug reports, every day we check our sleep plan upvote board as well as our Zendesk customer support tickets. We also try to keep our eye on other platforms such as Discord and Steam forums. The first thing that we do is categorize the report based off of two main factors. The first one being, how much does this impact the person's ability to play the game? And the second one being, how many reports of this do we have? Like whether or not that bug is new to us or if we already have a report of it internally. Then we prioritize and see if we can verify the issue on our end, as well as any concrete reproduction steps to cause the issue. Sometimes something that seemed complicated only needs a simple fix. And sometimes something that seems simple ends up being a whole can of worms because it's impacted by various different systems. Unfortunately, we don't usually know what situation we're in until we investigate them. Then for feedback, they are evaluated roughly on the following. The first being, does it align with our vision for the game? For example, we might not action upon something that asks us to completely change the genre of game into a sports one, for example. Then we evaluate how many players this will positively or negatively affect, as well as how big of an impact it happens to be on both sides. How quickly or easily can the feedback item be actioned upon? If it needs a complete overhaul of existing systems or for new systems to be built, then they'll need more time to make it into the game. Also, for the teams that need to work on that item, what does their current workload look like? Do we need to shift their priorities around? We're always trying to balance bug fixes and current adjustments to the game on top of also making new content for you all. Another thing that we've been asked about quite a lot is the offline mode, about how it's going and why it wasn't included in these updates. As previously mentioned in other materials, for the early access launch of Nightingale, we were focused on the multiplayer aspects that allow you to visit other players without being tied to a single character or realm. With Nightingale already having pretty high technical requirements, we decided early on to split the work between the server and your local PC. Various calculations and backend work are now having to be detangled and then recombined into just being done locally. This creates new challenges in terms of both development and testing in order to make sure that it is as close as possible to the online version. At the time of recording, we've made pretty significant progress on the offline mode and even have instances of it running on our PCs. But more work and testing is needed before we can share more details with you as to how it works, any additional technical requirements that might be needed, as well as a concrete timeline as to when it will be public. As the kids say, let it cook. We have heard from many enthusiastic builders that they dream of estates much larger than our current build limits, especially for those that share their realm with others. You might be wondering why we even have a building limit. And the TLDR is the larger the building size, the larger your file size is, and then the higher the likelihood that the game fails to load your save. The current limits that we have in the game are some of the highest stable limits that we have seen in testing. Work is going on to completely restructure how we handle building data so we can increase these limits, but that will take some time. We are looking to see if there are any adjustments we can make in the short term, but until this work can be complete, likely we'll continue to see a limit persist even into offline mode as it's not just a server consideration. We have been very impressed with the creativity of our community members when it comes to making their estates, whether it's connecting them in creative ways or splitting them off into little villages. We're also introducing some bug fixes into 0.2 that should address some of the inaccurate structure counting that we'd seen previously. We look forward to hearing from you all as to whether this is all resolved for good. Another thing we know players are hungry for is new content and we're currently working on new biomes, creatures, and building tile sets, but these larger content updates take more time to develop. So expect more news in the summer. Before then, we do have some smaller content updates planned similar to this one, 
where we introduced new bound weapons, NPCs, as well as quality of life features. And that's it for today. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time. Allez, merci à eux. J'espère que la traduction a été pour vous. C'était Cabon pour Nighting.